Hi, thank you so much for tuning in to watch ICC's online services. My name is Ravi and I'm the founder of the International Christian Community. Please do stay tuned because right after this message, there's something very important I'd like to share with you. So in the meantime, be blessed and enjoy. Just before I go to the message, let me just ask you as a congregation, um, you have come to church, you know, everybody goes to church, and then at the same time, sometimes in the church, you have different events that goes on. And in many churches, not every church, but in most churches, there's something that usually is called a cell group or a house group or a home group, whatever you want to call it, a Bible study group. How many of you that are here today, you have ever, ever, at least once, in your life attended or be a part of something we can call a home group of this nature. How many of you have experienced that before? Wow, that's amazing. It's almost every one of you. That's fantastic. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about today. And we also want to address the question, is this really biblical? Is it something that is written in the Bible? Or is it just a good idea? There's some things that are good ideas, and there's some things that are God idea. So this is what we are trying to find out about today. In introduction, as soon as I can get this to go, there are three aspects of church life. This is what we call a celebration service. We come together, we sing, we have a sermon, we go and have coffee, we celebrate. This is a celebration sermon. And then there's also another aspect of uh, service that is called congregation. Congregation is when you have a smaller group, you know, a group of singers like we were today. Uh, it was amazing. I, I, I was looking at the different nationalities that was here, the singers. Every single one was actually of a different nationality. That was amazing. And uh, then you have got groups that meets in different settings like, you know, PowerPoint or sound and uh, women's group. I, I understand the women had a breakfast uh, yesterday and that was wonderful. Yeah, here. And so you have different groups. That's what we call a congregation. And then you have this aspect called the cell. Three aspects of the ministry. The cell group is where you meet in the homes. And is this biblical? Is it necessary? Is it something that you should do? Or is it just a good idea by somebody? Now, also I want to know that if, uh, is home groups biblical? And also I want you to know that if I can get this to good. Understand that if you know how the Jewish history goes, then you will realize that why they did meet in the homes because of its, the historical meetings in the homes. Very quickly, Israel was a nation that was uh, meeting together and the focus was always around the temple. They worshipped in the temple and they had a very good, very strong family ties. But when they were not in favor with God anymore and they were asked to leave the country as God's judgment. They were spread all around uh, different parts of the world. And when they did that, they started to uh, also meet in what we call synagogues. It was so easy for them to meet in synagogues because part of the Jewish culture is every Friday night, they celebrate what you call the Sabbath or the Sabbath. Shabbat is when they come together as a family and they have the candles lit, we'll talk a little bit about it just now, and they have a family time where the head of the house, whoever is in charge, prays over the children, and they open up the Shabbat like that on Friday night, sundown, and on Saturday night, sun, sundown, they have a closing of the sub. So this family concept was very important, and having knowing this family concept, when they were thrown out of the country, every time there were 10 families, they gathered together to form a synagogue. And then it was also family-based. So the family tie was so important because it was something that came out of the home concept. Now, in some churches, there are different kinds of cell groups that they have. I'll just give you some examples. There are many, many, many examples, a few examples. First of all, we used to have in ICC uh, some years ago, we called something uh, a life group. And the word life had a meaning. L stood for... Love, I for instruction, F for fellowship, and last, E for evangelism. And as a result of that, we had groups formed. People came together, and, they, and, they, and uh, not in ICC, but when I was pastoring IPC, another church, we had something called Life Group. Some of you that are here 
you have actually attended one of those live groups. Can you remember? How many of you still remember live groups? <laughs> okay. <laughs> those days, way behind, <laughs> right? Now, then uh, later on, we started something else. We call it the Household Communion, which is very, very interesting. The Household Communion is something that has to do with meeting together on Friday nights, having a meal together, and actually having communion, you know, the bread and the wine together. I'll come back to that because that's exactly what I'm focusing on. Then uh, when we started ICC, we started something called G12. We had a group where everybody met together in 12s. Uh, some of you were also part of that. Is there anybody here that remembers G12 when we were together? It was a group of 12 people, basically. It was something we hoped to do. It was very, very popular at one time, and then the popularity kind of died off, and people got too busy. And also, we have something else that I hope I can get this to go. We have today what we call interest groups today in ICC. You have got an uh, African group. You have the women's group that just met. You have got uh, a youth group, actually, that meets. Uh, I would say young adults group that meets in uh, Victoria's Place. Youth group you have met in not too long ago in um, um, Tim's house and different ones. And then you have interest groups like the music team and all the different teams that we have. Now, going further, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts chapter 5, verse 42, day after day in the temple courts when Jesus was around uh, and Paul uh, the apostle was around, in the temple court, and from house to house, this is very, very important, and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. This is what the early church did. The early church had meetings in the temple courts where they gathered together, but they also met from house to house. This is important for me so you understand it's a Bible concept. Can everybody repeat after me, house to house? Once again, house to house. It's very important that I'm asking you to say this because this is not a good idea, but it's actually a God idea. It was something that was going on in the Bible. They met from house to house. So the question comes, what did they do from house to house? Well, it says here that they were teaching and they were proclaiming the good news. They never stopped. And they had it daily. Awesome. How could they do it so efficiently? It was not planned, it was not organized, but it was a concept. Because for the Jewish family to meet on a Friday in the Sabbath, it, on, the, on the Sabbath, was very common. It was normal. It was nothing special. They, they understood that concept. So when the apostles were meeting them from home to home, it was a very usual occurrence, except that instead of doing it just once a week, they did it much more often. Meeting in the homes is a very important aspect. It, it brings people closer together, but it also brings about a great fellowship where you have got good relationships and you're sharing each other's burdens, struggles, prayers, and it brings uh, the, the church as well as fellowship together. Now, in some churches, some people say that, you know, I, I feel very, very uh, lonely in this church, in my church, because uh, I don't know anybody. Now, knowing somebody doesn't just happen because you come to church once a week. Are you following me? You got to build a relationship. It's two ways. It's as much as you, you know, try to get to know somebody else, likewise, somebody else gets to know you. It takes time and it takes work on two sides. And one of the most intimate things that you can do is opening up your home to somebody else, somebody you know, not just anybody. You understand? I mean, I would like to open up my home, but I want to know who is walking in. You don't just like, like let any Tom, Dick or Harry walk into your house. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You've got to be cautious. So you build a relationship, and then when you open up your home, it's a very intimate way of having relationship. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about in the book of Revelation. Jesus was talking to one church. He says, listen, I stand in the door and knock, which is very unusual because in the Jewish culture in those days, they didn't keep doors closed. We have today in our homes what we call a closed door concept. But when I was growing up in Asia, in our neighborhood, with all the different families. You know, we never closed the door. The doors was always open. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's kind of hard to understand this in the Western world. But where I grew up, doors were never closed. In fact, it was very rude to have your doors closed. The doors was always open. That was our culture. 
But of course, today you can't do that because of security and the insurance will not cover you if your door is not closed and locked, <laughs> if you get robbed. <laughs> so it's, of course, we understand you've got to close your door. But in those days, when Jesus said, behold, I stand in the door and knock, in a Jewish mind, the first question that comes, who, who closed the door? Who shut the door? Unless it was nighttime, you shut the door. So when Jesus said, behold, I stand in the door and knock, and if you open the door, I will come in and I will sup, I will eat with you. That was actually a very uh, a reason of having a close fellowship. That's exactly what should happen in a church where you should have the best of relationships with others where you can openly tell them if they are doing something good or something bad. You have this feeling that if I correct you, it's not because I, I don't like you, it's because we have this relationship where we can connect to, to, with each other. Are you following me? Therefore, in a church, it's not really the job of a leader to go around telling people, hey, you should uh, spend more time together. It's actually the job of the, of the congregation. We can organize it, but it's up to you to be able to say, I would like to invite people to be closer together with me. Now, why we want to talk about the Sabbath just a little bit, not because we're going to practice the Sabbath, but the principle of the Sabbath is very important for us to understand. If you were in a Jewish family, how many of you have ever uh, practiced or at least been in, experienced a, a, a Sabbath before? Can I see your hands? Wonderful. When we make our trips to Israel, we usually are invited by our tour guide to his house. To, to celebrate the Shabbat. I remember the first time I was in Israel, one of the church uh, we were attending had a, a Friday, uh, it was a Christian mess Messianic group. They had a Friday night Shabbat where Lillian and me was invited and we were part of it. It was a wonderful thing. They had a big Shabbat celebration together. The principle, the principle of the Sabbath is very important. Uh, we don't want to be extreme like the, you know, uh, the, the seven days Adventist who says, okay, we only have to go to church on Saturday or go back to the Jewish roots and says, now we're following the, the, the Jewish roots. That's because those things that was done in the Shabbat had a purpose, a meaning for this thing that's going on. What actually happens in a Shabbat? On a Friday, when the sun goes down, they, they start the Shabbat, the family comes together. And what they do is that they have got candles. They, had, they light two candles, um, you know, on a table. They have a table. The family gathers together. You have the mother and, uh, uh, and the father and the sons. It's either the mom or the dad, you know. There are many different forms of Shabbat. I'm just giving you the general idea of what happens. There are two candles. Usually the candle holder looks like Jerusalem. Uh, not always, but the reason why they have the candle holder that looks like the shape of Jerusalem or something that's significant to Jerusalem is because they, wherever they are in the world, when they light the candle, they, they say that we're always remembering Jerusalem. We will never forget Jerusalem. So they have the candles, they light the candles, and then they have got two loaves of bread. Not one, but two. The reason is because during the time when Moses and the children of Israel were in the wilderness. Every day they were given manna, but on Friday they were given double portion. That's because they should rest on Saturday and not work. So that's why they have two loaves of bread uh, to remember the double portion. And then they have a cup, which is usually uh, made out of uh, uh, wine and, um, and it was shared among the family. And last but not least, there were prayers. What happens is that the head of the house usually lights the candle, after lighting the candle, there's a prayer that is said. And the prayer is to thank God who created lights and, and, uh, and, and the prayer over the lights. Then later on comes uh, the bread, uh, the cup, the bread which is taken, and they pray over the bread, and then the bread is broken, and it is shared with the members of the family, and the cup is also shared. It's exactly as, as what was going on on the, um, the Last Supper. Exactly the same thing. Now, Usually after this, what the father does is that the father calls the children, maybe it's the, you know, how many, however many kids you have, and uh, the head of the house would lay hands and say a blessing over the children. And some of these blessings are exactly as the priestly blessing, as we do in the church. It says, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you, exactly almost the same things. And the concept is to remember that all the elements in the, in the Shabbat uh, was actually uh, to... to, to point towards the Messiah. He is the light of the world. He is the bread that was broken for us. He is the cup which represents the new covenant and the praying over the, 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 the children. This actually brings the children and the parents very closely. This is done every single Friday till today in a Jewish house. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome, isn't it? 
Now, um, we're not going to do that, you know. If you want to, it's completely okay. I'm not stopping you. But what I'm saying is that the concept of coming together and remembering the Lord is very, very biblical as a family. And it ties the parents closer to the families. We have such a challenge today with families not being close together. Sometimes we can be so close and yet so far. We have got sometimes some of the best dinner, you know, dining table and wonderful kitchen in the house, but that doesn't mean it, it has brought peace. You cannot buy peace. You have to pray that God brings peace. Sometimes you may not have the best kitchen or the good dining table and all these wonderful apartments and furnitures, but there's love in the house. Love doesn't just happen. You create it. You pray to God to bring it into the house. Amen? And that's one of the things that I'm trying to share with you that we need as uh, Christians, as believers, those who are born and raised here in Denmark, as well as those of you who moved here to Denmark, we need to have that strong family um, connection which comes from working on it week after week, week after week, 52 times a year. Why 52 times a year? Because there's 52 weeks. <laughs> Are you with me? First of all, uh, I would like to revive what we call the family communion uh, in ICC. 2016, we're going to do this. And how we're going to do this is that um, we have got families that are meeting in you know, quite a few places. From the survey that we have done, we have found there are many, many families living all over the country, scattered all over the place. I'm trying, I would like to bring families together on Fridays in the evenings, uh, at least once, at least once uh, with one family uh, throughout the whole country. And what I'd like to do is that I'd like to go with you and I'd like to be with you in the home and just demonstrate to you what it means to have a family communion. What we'll do basically is very simple. We're going to have uh, somebody who is the head of the house who will pray or if, if, uh, to, to pray over the uh, persons that are there. We'll gather together and it doesn't have to be a big meal. We'd like to have some food, you know, everybody eats. Do you eat every day? <laughs> So if you create some small extra portion, it's totally okay. And the focus shouldn't be on the food, but the focus is just to get people together. We'll have a little food. We have a little fellowship, just as it was in the, in the, in the Shabbat. We'll have some bread. We'll have some wine or, or grape juice or whatever you want to have. It's perfectly okay. And, uh, and, and demonstrate it. And we'll have a little instruction. Uh, you think, okay, I'm not good in, in the Bible. You know, I, This is not my, my cup of tea. No problems. Today, you can just go to the internet and there are many what you call daily Bible guidelines. One suggestion that I'll make is something called the, the daily bread. Or you have something called the word of the day. So you, it's a very short passage. It's a scripture with a short passage. Whoever is the head of the house could read that. Everybody could contribute, say that was really great, that was a blessing, or okay, I've learned something. And then pray for everyone and just be together and just, just get the family together. And I hope that when we start this in one family that you will carry on. I'll just be there as the starter. I'll give you this starting package where I'll come and demonstrate to you how it can be done. And hopefully we have homes gathering together and coming together. Don't you think that'll be wonderful? Only three people said, hmm. Ah, oh, come on. Don't you think that'll be wonderful? Amen. Bringing people together. And it's your own, you know, uh, desire. It's not that we want to force. We don't want to organize it. We don't want to, you know... We want it to become something that happens because it is something you want. And of course, we will never force this. We'll ask you ahead of time and say, hey, would you like to have this? I'm going to come by this weekend. Prepare you so that if there's maybe one or two families nearby you, you can bring them or just your family. It's perfectly okay. But this year, we will revive what we call the household communion. Now, can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> okay. Some of you are saying, no, man. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now, anyone can open your house and uh, what you need to do is you need to sign up, of course, uh, so that we know where to start. The person that you should uh, sign up with is Lillian because she's responsible for the cell groups in this house. Uh, Lillian, there are two Lillians in this church. There's Lillian from Rwanda, that's Eve's wife, and there's Lillian from Singapore, that's my wife. Okay, so the one that takes care of the cell groups is my wife. Lillian, uh, the only Chinese-looking person here, I think, or maybe two, there's also Japanese. Okay, sign up, say, hey, well, I'd like to have this experience. Uh, please uh, book a time, book a date. I'll be there uh, in that Friday evening and we'll have this wonderful time together. 
And now is the real conclusion. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20, Paul said, You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. This is public teaching. Paul did that in the synagogues and in the, in the temple places. But Paul also went from house to house so that he could actually be with people and teach and bring them together. And this is exactly what we want to do. So anyone can open your house. I would strongly encourage you to sign up so that we can be a part of these biblical cell groups and get to know each other better. And in closing, I just say this to you before I hand it over to, to uh, Sandra. Um, like I started by saying that in some churches, uh, one of the big problems is that people are lonely. They don't know each other. Now, in Denmark, right here in Denmark, there are many, many lonely people. You'll be surprised at how many people are lonely. And, uh, and it's not right. It shouldn't be that way. Uh, loneliness is, it creeps into you and it makes you feel so isolated and you should never be isolated. So if there's anybody that can be a good example to the society, it should be the church. And why? Because you have an example in the Bible. It was given to us. We should be the ones that should be uh, generating such excitement in terms of people getting to know each other. And with the family, with the kids, with you know, the adults, that should be our speciality. So it is sad, I think, that in our generation, we have people who are even in the church so lonely and so isolated. Uh, I pray to God that that will not happen, that we will break that and we'll create such bonds in the families that there will be this wonderful excitement every weekend that I'm bringing the family together and we're going to eat anyway. And so sometimes when two families come together, somebody can say, look, this time I bring the food or this time you bring the food. It's not about the food. It's just about the fellowship. Are you with me? And let's come against loneliness. Let's break it. Why? Because it's biblical not because we want to. And then we'll have good relationships and nobody should be feeling lonely. And it's not the responsibility of the church leadership. It is a responsibility of the congregation. What we do is we, we facilitate it, we show it, we demonstrate it, but you must have the discipline to carry on. If not with others, just as a family. And there should never be one lonely person in the congregation. God forbid, I pray. Amen? So therefore, I ask you this morning that why are we talking about biblical cell groups or biblical home groups? Because it is in the Bible. And we should be the best examples. And I hope and pray that uh, we can manage this. And of course, we'll organize it. Sometimes you may be staying ge geographically close to each other as a church, but you might not feel, have the chemistry. Sometimes it's okay if you don't have the chemistry with some other people. That's totally okay. It's normal. So then you'll find somebody who lives further. So you have the chemistry. Therefore, when you open your house, you will decide who you would like to have with you so that there's some kind of a chemistry and some kind of a connection. And that's when the relationships and the bonds will be built. Amen. Hi again. I hope you were blessed by what you have just watched. Now, our vision is to help you to get in touch with God, others, and your destiny. In case you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, this is a time and an opportunity for you to pray a simple prayer to receive Him into your heart. All you need to do is to say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me on the cross. Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Saviour. Holy Spirit, help me to live a life as a true believer. Amen. That was a simple prayer, but if you believed in that prayer and you repeated it and received Jesus into your heart, you're born again. And we really want to keep in touch with you and ask you to continue to watch some of these teachings so that you can grow in your spiritual life. Now, if you'd like to be a part of this ministry, you can support us in three different ways. One of the ways is you can support us by praying. We'd really appreciate that. Pray for us. We covered the prayers of saints all around the world. Second, you can also do it by passing this link to somebody that you know. You know, somebody can be blessed and hopefully be connected to God just like you. Last but not least, you can also support us financially. There is a 
Link in your screen where you can go to our homepage and figure out how you can either be a one-time or an ongoing donor to this ministry so we can spread the good news far and wide. Look, whether this is the first time I'm going to see you or you may come back to see us again, I just want to pray that God bless you and I hope that you'll have a wonderful day. Thank you and stay in touch. See you, bye.